Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. So, Jessica, we are premiering on YouTube. This is exciting. Makes me a little nervous, but super excited. I'm ready. I'm oh, let's toast. You know what? I think I actually toast this way and then. You? Okay. I toasted the wrong way before. I toasted oh. this way. I think I, I toast know. this way and let's try it. Oh, Hopefully. I've always from you, Tom. I didn't know there, there was a, an appropriate way to toast, but. No, because on the the camera shows the mirror image. You, okay, oh. let, let's let's try this way, but okay. then let's also try this way. Okay. Put it to the other, go the other way. Okay, we'll go this way. Wait, oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. we'll see, we'll see which one actually we clanked. Is that the right word, clanked? Clanked, yes, I believe yeah. that's, that's correct. Right. That we clanked our becoming radiant thermoses. Ah, so I'm Tom Zuba and I wrote the book Permission to Mourn. And I very, very, very intentionally chose this phrase as the subtitle, a new way to do grief. Every Thursday, 11 a.m. Central, right here on YouTube, my program assistant, Jessica and I, are gonna talk about a new way to do grief. So I'm gonna pretend like I haven't seen you in a while. How are you, Jessica? I am good, crazy busy, but if it's, it's a good crazy busy. So today I'm excited because at about 1120, Ryder's mom is gonna be with us. Ryder is a chill, magical dude who's on the other side. And his mom actually had lunch several times with Patricia Brennan Zuba in Chicago before I even knew that Patricia Brennan Zuba existed. Amazing. How could no that be? No coincidence whatsoever. And like we are loved so much that somehow, some way, Shelly Buck, writer's mom, has been drawn to us. And at 11.40, about 11.40, we're going to bring Susan on. I know Susan through her son, Ari. And I chatted with her and Liz a week ago, Tuesday. And this is what Susan said, she said she goes on her walks and she calls Ari's presence in. I was like, I got to extend the conversation there. What exactly is it that you're talking about? I can't wait to have that conversation with her. And I was able to meet her in person at Joni's in your, um, for your North Carolina retreat in 2018. That's right. That's right. Yeah, which was just two years ago, because that you know, one of the glorious things about Facebook, you have those wonderful reminders that will pop up on your timeline, and I can't believe it's been two years. But that's true. I mean, here we all are on the other side. You premiering this amazing show and having Susan on, having me here in my little kitchen. It's amazing. And do you know what? Our mascot is here with us too. <laughs> the owl. The owl, the mascot, yes. Did Calling you know what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some type of, uh, I don't wanna call it a contest because a contest implies winners and losers. Right. But we do have to name the owl. So both, <laughs> that are listening either live or to the recording, if you have a suggestion for what the owl's name should be, yeah. put it in a comment, put it in a comment. And if you have absolutely no idea at all why the owl is our mascot, we'll let you know. Okay, we'll let you know next Thursday at 11 a.m. Central right here. 
So I'm I'm noticing that you are sporting a pretty cool shirt. Isn't that awesome? Hey, we're, we're, we're twinning right now. We are twinning. So explain to people what went on, how this happened. Yeah. So I didn't plan on this happening. Of course, I came up to spend some time with you in Rockford to work on our agenda. You have an amazing retreat planned for next weekend. Um, hosting some beautiful radiant souls that are coming into Rockford, Illinois to enjoy autumn in Rockford and for all of us to have a healing space together. And I'm so excited about it. Um, so I came up to, to sit with you and then I knew that we were going to be sitting with CW and then it just kind of morphed from there. He, you were talking about plans and he and I started designing a shirt. And so this actually says, and yours says the same thing. I signed up for this. I signed up for this. So we were putting in kind of different, oh, how do you want to say taglines? Because that makes it sound cheesy and unauthentic. And everything that we were thinking of had to be authentic and something that really, really resonated. And this is not something that I would have thought of three years ago or four years ago or five years ago, but through working with you and discovering a new way to do grief and a new way to do life and a new way to have a framework for, I believe why I came, why my daughter, Olivia, who passed three years ago, why she came, I believe we did get to sign up for this. So it's beautiful. It makes me feel extra connected to her and to God and to why we're all here, lovingly connected and centered. And then the infinity, which I love, I've always loved it. There's no beginning, there's no end. It's eternal, much like love and life and my own belief system. And also I loved the, the magical age of eight was really empowering for me. My daughter passed at age eight, no coincidences. And then the spark in the center of the heart, the heart is significant for Olivia and I, for many people, I'm assuming as well. Um, but it signifies something different for us. And then that radiant burst in the center, which you use so much on your becoming radiant. And I think of it as it's empowering, it's a soul, it's light, it's bright, it's everything that feels good and makes me feel connected. So thank you, CW, for helping me create this. And I got three of them and I'm going to be purchasing more. How long did it take you guys to create that, to come up with it? Goodness. I mean, once we started kind of plugging in different phrases, but this one came up almost immediately. And then, um, and then I, I knew that I wanted the infinity and I said in something with a heart and he, he is such a creative genius, as you know, as many people know, and as the world will come to know. And he Immediately, even the words that I wasn't even articulating perfectly, he just saw my vision, felt my vision and, and made it come to be. So like 30 minutes tops, all right there discussing it. And, and I was just thanking him. I said, you know, I'm just so grateful you made this happen. And he said, this is what I love to do. This is why I'm doing this. And just with such sincerity. So, so what yeah. we'll do is in the comments below, we'll share a link to CW's business, which is Ronan Branding. Yeah. Uh, his name is not actually CW. His first name is Chris. His last name starts with the W. I cannot pronounce it. It's a multisyllabic name with an SKI. So I call him CW. You know, what's really interesting. The universe is continually, continually, continually making itself aware to us. So you very consciously talked about the eight infinity and the meaning of that to you. Mm -hmm. So my 88 year old father died two days after his 88th birthday. His birthday is April 6th. My 88 year old father died on April 8th. My goodness, 88. Eight, 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 eight. 
So if folks love this like we do, they can order it at tomzuba.com. Tomzuba.com. And does it just come in black? He actually, I, so I just um, had a, a Zoom with CW this morning and he's designing, no, it'll be multiple colors and multiple different. I love the off the shoulder. Um, so we made a couple of t-shirts and then we posted one on your page and then I, I shared it on, on mine as well. But so what we did there is we actually just, because I like a wider um, off the shoulder. So we just cut it ourselves. We kind of coutured it. But the, the goal would be, and that's just because that's what I like to do. So the goal would be that we get to design um, multiple different styles. So what's going to appeal to, to, to whoever. And then that's, that's our choice, right? To get to kind of personalize it a little bit more. So we'll be in multiple colors. And then below it, below I signed up for this, we have a new way. And then TZ, because it is a new way. I wouldn't have, like I said, I wouldn't have come up I wouldn't have thought four years ago that I would have this belief system. Yeah, so a new way of doing grief is to open to the possibility that life isn't random, that life actually happens for us, not to us. And words are limiting, but in cahoots with your version of G-O-D and in cahoots with the souls of all those that you're connected to and that you love. And if you believe in angels and if you believe in non-physical guides, in cahoots with the entire universe, literally for the good of the all, you signed up for this. Olivia signed up for this. Lily signed up for this. I signed up for it, Trish did, Erin did, Rory did. And the most fascinating contract of all is my son Sean's contract that, that at, 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 at three years old, this little soul would think, oh, I know it's a great idea for me to come in with a dead sister. My mom leaves her physical body at three. And then when I'm nine, my 13 and a half year old brother, I mean, it is a new way. It's absolutely a new way. And all we're suggesting is, hey, maybe it'll resonate with you. If it doesn't, move along, move along, move along. There's plenty of other interesting, fascinating stuff we have to chat about. Absolutely. And one of the things that I appreciate so much about you is that you don't preach to what a, what one belief system should be, how it fits in a box, and how in order to be part of a grieving or, or your grieving and, and bereavement community that it needs to be in, as in a, within a certain parameter that everybody is invited to have their own specific belief system. But I decided a long, in- long, long time ago that I was gonna stand in truth. And what is true for me Mm-hmm. is that every single living, hu- breathing human being, each one of us, we actually have our own belief systems. That's cool. That's very, very cool. And I am literally fascinating in what you believe and you believe in the next person and the next person. And I'm wise enough finally to say, I'll tell you what I believe today on October 8th at 1116 AM Central, Please don't hold that to me because my beliefs are fluid. They're really, really fluid. I agree with you. After my daughter Erin died, the notion that I had signed up for this, that I agreed to this, I would say, are you effing kidding me? No, 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 no. Yeah, I probably would have smacked someone in the face as loving and as kind as I am if someone had told me right after Olivia's diagnosis, she actually signed up for this and you did too. And so did Lily. And your parents and everybody that loves her, I would have come unglued. Yeah, it's but, too much. Yeah. I mean, it's too much. Yeah, I, again, I think the seeds are planted at the right time. You know, the student and the teacher, you, you know, you're given the, um, the appropriate message or maybe in a different form in a different way at the right time when it can, when it can land, um, when it can kind of take root and if it's applicable. 
I, I agree. And that's been my experience. And what I've come to observe in myself and in all the people that I coach with one-on-one, -on -one, with the people that take my on online classes is what we've collectively created is that until we suffer, we're really not open to learning or we're really not open to change. You know, when I'm floating on a raft in the pool on an 85 degree day, you know, and I have a Mai Tai or a pina colada or both, I'm not learning. I'm not open to questioning. It's when I'm in the deepest, deepest pits of despair that I like finally raise my head and go, I'm tired of suffering please tell me there's another way. Please tell me there's another way. Yeah. I mean, I always, that is the ultimate wish in order, you know, to be able to have the growth and the lessons and then the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom gained, but to not have to suffer. I mean, it just, I don't believe that life works that way. Yeah. So and God, those that, and I don't even think that they exist. It just hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet, but so one of the ways that you and I are going to make sure that we don't suffer, as you said, is next weekend, we're doing a very COVID responsible live in-person retreat at my brand new retreat center. So you're going to be with me live next Thursday at 11 a.m. Central when we do episode number three. How exciting is that, that we're going to be able to, to be kind of, we're going to have that well, it will be, the, yeah, the day of, the day I of. Know. Yeah. I know, and what would be really, really cool is if we could do it outside with a live audience. Oh, that would be. Maybe we'll do question and answers from the people that are attending the retreat. I'd love that. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm gonna bring on our guest. I'm gonna bring on our very first guest. Her name is Shelly Buck. She wrote a beautiful, beautiful book called Leave Your Light On, Leave Your Light On. And what's really interesting, my friend, Patty, who is one of Trisha's very, very, very best friends. Honestly, in Trisha's inner circle, Patty was one of five. So Patty said to me, I have this friend, she wrote a book, she's aware of you from your Facebook lives, she really loves what you're doing, would you be able to help her you know, broaden the audience for her book. Trisha's friend, Patty, asked me if I would do that. Yes, yes, yes. So I looked up Shelly Buck. You know, I wanted to get a sense for who she is. One of her Facebook friends is my Uncle Hank. Oh, my goodness. One of Shelly Buck's Facebook friends is my Uncle Hank who died about two years ago, two or three years ago, and lives in Sierra Madre, California. So talk about a small, small, small world. Absolutely. In August, in August uh, towards the end of August on a Tuesday night, I had a 90 minute conversation with Shelly. She told us about her son Ryder, his life, his death, her road to healing. Talked a lot about her book, Leave Your Light On. But in a follow-up, email she said something to me that i have not forgotten and that's what i want to talk with her about so welcome 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 shelly buck welcome shelly buck just connecting oh, shelly. welcome shelly we can see you we can hear you you're on mute Can you see us? Yes, there you go. There I'm you not go. hearing you. Hi. Not, you can't no, hear. I'm not hearing you. I don't know why. Hmm. Oh, you, uh, you can't working. hear us? Let's see. No, we're working out the technical get oh, difficulty. This just, is real life happening. Uh, it's like we're just like CNN. We're just like dancing with the stars. We're just, we're all. I'm trying dancing. to read your lips, Tom. <laughs> There's, oh dear um unmute uh, i'm gonna um geez okay i don't see anything here i'm so sorry no, no, that's no, okay 
It'll all work out. Um, you know what I might be able to do? If she can see the chat, I can just ask her questions. Let me just chat. unplug my microphone. No, that's not working. Is that any better? Well, we can uh, still hear you. I don't know if you can. You now. I can hear you, Jessica. Tom, can you say something? Oh, perfect. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, that's fine. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is so nice to meet with you again. I see you a lot on your different formats, but it's nice to meet with you again. So I already introduced you and I introduced okay. your chill, magical sun rider. Okay. I talked about the fact that you have a beautiful, beautiful book called Leave Your Light On. Yes. And when we concluded our conversation in August, which folks can find on my YouTube channel, you said something to me in your follow-up email and it really, really, really touched my heart. And you said that you were so comfortable and that we could have continued the conversation for five or six hours. It was like we were old friends sitting around and you said that you really believed that you were changed, that something shifted in you as the result of our time together. Absolutely. I feel like um, this whole process of writing the book has been cathartic to say the least, but then telling my story with someone like you who brings out the very deepest, most poignant um, points uh, really brought me further. It just, it was like having a private session with you, which I haven't done, but maybe we'll do that. Um, it, uh, yeah, it just, it just brought me along. I felt really light and um, yeah. Do you still feel light? Do you still feel some of that? Are you able to reach back and pull that back up? Yes, yes, somewhat. Um, when I get in touch with Ryder is when I feel the lightest, of course. It's his light that brings me forward. Um, so uh, that and, of course, staying in touch with you on your different formats has helped just to keep that, um, that light uh, going. So how are you able to stay in touch with Ryder? Well, I talk to him a lot. Um, and I recently asked him for a sign and he came to me in a dream that night. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I meditate and call him in and, um, I, I listen to his, um, his music, which I've shared with you. Yes. Great. Seriously, this is what I want to ask you. So you, you sent me three of them. I intentionally have not opened them yet because I want to know which is your favorite. Oh my gosh. Well, that's so hard, but let me say that Leave Your Light On is the one where Ryder recorded all of the vocals. No, that's Life After Life. Well, good. The one with Ryder's, yeah. No, that's three of three. That's the last one. You, so, just got, you just got to say both of the names of the CDs. Oh, thank you. You're so smart. Um, yes, that's Leave Your Light On. And on that, on that CD, Ryder sings everything. There are five original tunes and one cover. And um, uh, he recorded all of that before he passed. And then we filled it in. It's his guitar and his vocals. And we filled it in with studio musicians after he passed put it out in 2014. And then the so other, th go ahead. Th so this is really, really, really a labor of love and a gift from your family to the world. Yes, yes. All three of them are because the other two then have a couple of songs where writer sings, um, one on each of them or a couple on each of them. And uh, the rest of them, his youngest brother Reed um, sings, writer's parts and they sound so similar that even Reed couldn't tell the difference in the voices. And so, where can people find these? Um, let's see, uh, iTunes and you can go to writerbuckmusic.com and they're sold there. But iTunes is probably the easiest, Spotify. Um, and they are listed two ways. One is under Ryder Buck because that's just him. 
And the other two are Ryder Buck and the Breakers. So. Do you have an all time, I know I asked you what your favorite CD of the three was, but do you have an all time favorite song? Oh boy, that's really hard. Um, a lot of people, and I love Hangin', but that's on one of the other two CDs. I don't remember which one. Um, uh, of course, Leave Your Light On is really special because that became the name of his book and was really his mantra. But I love Down to the River. I love Bella Note. I always think of you when I hear that. I just think of you and Trish. Mm. Yeah. So um, those are probably my three favorites. But boy, there are some beautiful ones. There's one on three of three, uh, the last album we did, that he sent posthumously through a friend. And uh, she receives messages from Ryder like a fax. And so she got this message and it was a poem. And one of his bandmates put it to music and um, the, our lead female vocalist sings it. And it's, um, it's on the audio book, but it's also on three of three. It's really beautiful. So I know there are people that will be listening that say, huh? What do you mean Ryder sent you this song? What do you mean he comes to you? What do you mean you connect with him? I want to know, prior to Ryder's passing, was this who you were or did you become open to connecting with your son as a result of his death? It was really as a result of his death. Now, we connected on a, on a deep intuitive level when he was alive. We didn't always have to talk to know where each other was, um, if that's correct grammar. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, could, we could connect just um, when he went to Bali his last summer, uh, he was gone for a month, dropped his phone in the ocean. We had no way to contact him except for uh, Facebook. And I just gave him time and space to find himself anew. It was after the cancer and he was really getting away from cancer mom and the cancer house and reinventing himself in a new way. And so we just connected through our hearts and I never felt really separated from him, um, which is really remarkable because it's a long, it's a long way away and it was a long time, but um, we stayed, we stayed connected. Let, let's also let people know, I'm a, I'm a boy from the Midwest. You're a gal from the Midwest. Yes. And even though you live in Southern California now, I mean, your beliefs and your expansion has come a long, long, long way from who we were when we were growing up. Absolutely. I was always, I was always interested in um, psychic abilities and, uh, but never really felt like I had any. Um, but intuition is something we all have and can be developed and the contact can be made just by staying in touch. I can sit in my car and listen to writer CDs, which are all I have in my car right now, although I may be getting early sixes to add to that. Um, I really like their music. Uh, and I feel like he's in the car with me, sitting right beside me. And I, and I, don't, I don't mean it in, I mean in a very real way, like, like his presence is there. And when I go on, um, I'll go on my computer sometimes or even on my phone. And sometimes it's, it's remarkable. His videos will pop up. And so I watch them um, and it brings him present so, so clearly and so profoundly. Um, and, and would you say I'm going to use the word gift, but a gift of his life and a gift of his passing is that was your invitation 
to become aware of and develop the psychic ability that I agree that we all have. Um, yes, absolutely. The minute, I mean, as soon as he passed, I was, I was searching. I was seeking contact with him. I went to a psychic medium um, several, several, several times. It was really on the regular because she always got um, writerisms that were just undeniably writerisms. It's not something that anyone could make up. Um, and I lived for those. And then I started, I think she coached me a little bit to meditate and call him in. And I'm not great at meditating. I'm really kind of a high strung um, energetic type. So sitting and being still is something that I've really had to practice. Um, but it works, you know, he shows up. So Shelly, Jessica's with us. Jessica is co-hosting yeah. this hour with me. Jessica, do you meditate? I do. And so Shelly, I can so relate to what you're, to everything that you're saying regarding kind of having that, that nervous energy being a little bit more high strung. Although I probably don't come off that way. And I don't know. It's always interesting how we're perceived and how we believe we right. feel on the inside, but it's so hard just to quiet my mind. And, you know, they call it a lot in yoga and in meditation, like the monkey brain where it bounces right. all over but that's when I do feel the most centered. So I think that's when I'm feeling that I think that's when, okay, this is when I really should be meditating or prayer or whatever anybody calls it at home. Right. Uh, so my question to do you, would you, would you do that? Are you able to connect with writer every time? Um, well, it depends on the interruptions. We have four dogs. Sometimes I get interrupted. Okay. Um, but, uh, Pretty much, yes. Um, it, it more or less profoundly. Sometimes it's something that really knocks me out. And once I had a, a shiver run through my body, not just a chill, but like a sparkly energy. And that was remarkable. I mean, I felt like he was holding me. Um, mm. Yeah, that was a big one. Does that surprise you that you're able to say, you know, the relationships actually does continue? Oh, it does continue. And that's been my lifeline. Without that, I think I would have disintegrated. I know I would have killed myself. Yeah. So I remember was the first things that came when I was reading Tom's book is that the relationship gets to continue. And that was such a game changer. I remember reading that where I was at and just the invitation and then the knowing, you know, that resonated. I knew that that was true, but I had never heard that before, but it does get to continue. It definitely does. And, um, and it's stronger sometimes, you know, yeah. when he was, when he was here, he was not always this calm, chill, lovely human being. He was a uh, pistol sometimes. And especially at home where things were, uh, chaotic maybe with his younger brother um he has two brothers but one of them was away at school um and he uh so he would kind of blow off steam here and um but what he sought always was a chill vibe someplace where he could just relax and He'd go out back in our yard. There's a little circle of stones and trees that I set up when the boys were young. And he would meditate out there, play his guitar. Um, God knows what else he did, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was always looking for the, the calm. This yeah. is hard. I think it's really, really hard for people to comprehend, particularly if they're new in their grief. And when I say new, I'm not talking about time. It could be two months, it could be two years, it could be 12 years. Right. I'm talking about how much work have you done to heal? But for me, I most sincerely mean this, Trish, Rory and Aaron are more present to me, are more alive, are more connected to me than ever in my entire life. 
Right. I honestly believe that they're above me, below me, on either side of me, in back of me, and in front of me. I was just talking with the client this morning. When you meet me, you meet the four of us. That's number one. And number two, anyone that's paying attention to me, they're like, how are you able to do everything that you do? It's not just me. It's the four of us that are working together. It's a team of four. That's, that's the truth. That's my experience. Absolutely. I felt Ryder, well, Ryder was hand in hand with us on the writing of this book. Um, he came through all the time and we would, you know, get to a point where we were worried about something or stressed about something. And I would always get his voice, chill, mom, it's going to be okay. Just take it easy and, and let it unfold. But mostly chill, mom. Those are his words. So the book is called Leave Your Light On. Where can folks find it? Well, they can find it on Amazon. That's probably the easiest. It's um, also in Barnes and Noble. Uh, if you go to leaveyourlightonbook.com, there's, um, there are links to several places that sell it. We're now in a local bookstore. If you want to support local bookstores, it's called Flint Ridge Books. Um, and they will ship. So that's probably the easiest. You can also get it on writerbookmusic.com. So can you hang with us a little bit longer? Absolutely, sure. So there's no coincidences. I promise you, I did not plan this, but I mean, clearly writer is the force of nature. Ryder and Ari, you don't know who Ari is, but you're going to meet Ari's mother in a moment. You live in Southern California. Ari's mother lives in Northern California. You, you have a child. Ryder has a sibling who's a vocalist. Two siblings Ari that are vocalists, two of them. Okay, yeah. two siblings. Ari has a sister who just put out the most extraordinary CD. Many of the songs written as a result of her brother's life, her brother's death. So I'm gonna bring on Susan. And what fascinated me about Susan is she and I and Liz had a conversation on Tuesday night. And she said something very similar to what you said, that, that one of the ways that she cares for herself and one of the ways she meditates is she calls his presence in. And for her, that was just a throwaway line. You know, oh, I call, I call Ari's presence in. I wrote it down and I thought, I need to circle back. I need for you to explain that to us. So I'm gonna bring Susan on right now. Great. I did see your podcast with her. You did? Oh, okay, good, 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 good. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi there. Susan, so Susan, this is phenomenal. This is what Ari has created for us, unbeknownst to me. This is Shelly Buck. Shelly lives in Southern California. Like you, Shelly has a young adult son who's on the other side. Like you, Shelly has a young adult son on the other side who had cancer, although he did not die from cancer. Oh. Like you, Shelly has two children that are musical and that have kind of taken on the baton of singing their brother's songs. You know, Jessica? Yes, I do. Hi. Oh. So, so I'm going to be with you, Shelly, and with you, Susan, when the three of us meet in person. Jessica, yes. you can come along because that is absolutely going to happen. But what I'm intrigued about is when you and I and Liz chatted on Tuesday, there was this line that you just kind of tossed off. And I wrote it down because I take copious notes and I knew I needed to circle back to you. You love nature. It's very healing for you to go out and walk and walk and walk and walk as it's healing for Shelly. And you said, I call in his presence. I call in his presence. Tell us about that. How did you learn how to do that? And how might other people 
call in their beloved's presence? Well, you know, I've been um, thinking about this and I think one thing um, is being open. Um, I think so many of us, we only uh, function from our brain and we believe all the thoughts that we have and our, our, our brain has a purpose, which is to keep us safe and to you know, get certain functions and things done. And it, it's a doubting brain. And, I, I, and so we, I think that as human beings, we listen to that doubt and we think that our thoughts are facts and that, that's, that they're the only truth. And, you know, I think I was lucky. I'm a Midwest girl as well. And I remember as, I don't know, maybe I was 10 or 11, my dad, who's a very cerebral guy, shared a story with me about how he was driving his car and all of a sudden he pulled over to the side of the road when he was getting to a curve because there was just something that said to him, pull to the side of the road. This is not like my father. He's very, he, he's only in his head. And at that moment he pulls to the side and a motorcyclist comes around the curve on the wrong side of the road. So if my dad had kept on going, he would have hit him. And that made such an impression on me that there's something there, you know, kind of, of a voice, a voice to listen to. And, um, and then I went into hospice work and so many of my patients would share stories about how their loved ones came to them. Um, you know, I would come see them in the morning and they're like, oh, you know, my husband was here and it was always a, a relative that had died. And usually it was pretty close to the time that that person was going to die. So I just, I really listened to that and, you know, accepted there's, there's this mystery that we just do not understand because so many people kept on repeating the same situation. So when Ari died, all I knew is that I wanted to be with him. I needed to know where he was. I needed to continue to be with him. And I felt so fortunate because even after he left his body, I still felt his presence so, so strongly. I felt like he was just holding me, walking me through, you know, now we're going to the mortuary and we're gonna go talk to them. And now we're making the plans about my, you know, memorial service. I just felt him with me and, and I never doubted it. I just knew that he was there. And then of course there were so many signs and I just wanted more. I wanted more communication. And, and I was able to hear Shelly speaking. And I think our story is so very similar. Your relationship with your son, my relationship with my son, very, very close, very intuitive. So um, I knew that he wanted the same closeness and the same ability to communicate with me. So I, I, think, I think belief, you know, just believing that this was possible, a knowing that was deep into, in my gut, you know, that wasn't my wasn't my brain it was my my heart and my gut that was thinking and believing this and um you know feeling his presence and feeling that he was communicating me with me in a new way so I just started really listening and really keeping my eyes open and trying to keep my heart open to feel his presence and that used to, that would be my prayer please, you know, keep my eyes, my heart, my ears open so that I can feel Ari's presence. And I, and I felt often that he was speaking to me with the words from other people so that, um, you know, maybe I'd go to a yoga class and the teacher would happen to say something and it just would hit me as if those were words that Ari really wanted me to hear. And was it that Ari put those words in her mouth was it that Ari said, you need to go to this class. Mom, you need to be paying attention. Stop daydreaming. Focus on what she's going to hear. Whatever it was that made me open to hear those words at that time. And it just en enriched me so much. And um, so as far as the, the walking nature, like you said, is just really huge to me. And right before Ari died, 
uh, one day we went for a walk and his cousins were in town and Ari, when he died, was 26. And we went for a walk and we were with his cousins who were also 26. And, you know, at this point they were getting ready to get married and they had jobs. Ari had to stop all that. And we were walking together and then Ari said to me, hold my hand. So I took his hand, but I was aware that I was uncomfortable. It was like, he's 26, he's a big boy. What are they gonna think? And, and so I kind of let go of his hand and he's like, don't you wanna hold my hand? And that's like this ache in my heart because it's like he picked up on my feeling and that was right. That is how I was feeling. So after Ari uh, left his body and I would go out for a walk, I wanted to do over. I wanted to hold Ari's hand and I wanted to do it with pride and I wanted him to feel it. And so I think that's how I sort of started. It was like, Ari, we're holding hands. And I would just get quiet and I would focus. And I literally could feel a warmth in my hand and we would just walk together. And um, it was, it, I think like you all said, feeling his presence has been a, a saving grace and something that I could not have understood before his death. So I talk about seeing with new eyes, mm -hmm. hearing with new ears and feeling with a new heart. I call this my God given barometer. Yes. My God given barometer. And the truth is, it's exactly been my experience too, that my head is programmed to keep the status quo as it is, to protect me. So if I'm interested in healing, it's not gonna occur here. Yes. And, and you just painted a beautiful picture of dropping into your heart. That's where truth is. That's where healing is. You know, that's where the connection to our beloveds is. It's not, it's not up here. It's so true. And, you know, I feel like I really learned after Ari died that nobody else can tell me what the truth is. I know inside of me what the truth is. And um, so I really stopped listening to all the, chatter and then i also learned probably by experience that i had to really guard my experiences that i was having with ari they were sacred and i could not share them with everybody because you know you say it to somebody most people that have not had our experience and you just see that look over their eyes oh poor susan she is not coping well and she's having to make this up. So I, you know, I did take a lot of, um, well, I took some classes with uh, mediums. I went to a um, past life regression that Brian Weiss was having in town here. I did a lot of different things. And what I took away from them is trusting yourself and that sort of using your imagination to begin with. And I was thinking about that a little bit this morning when I was walking, because I was thinking about the word imagination. And I thought, hmm, imagination, it's kind of like intention. Intention is maybe a little bit more focused, but imagination feels a little bit looser, wider. Imagination, intention, manifesting, I don't know, somehow they all seemed related. And and so I think that using sort of maybe beginning as far as bringing our loved one is in, we are using our imagination. We, we can't, you know, they're not here right across sitting next to us in their physical form. So there is a way that we, we need to use that other, access that other part of us. I love what you're saying about imagination. And my immediate response is that when I'm willing to imagine, I'm actually opening a door or the door to the universe's knowing of what my optimal life is. It's the, un it's the universe's opportunity to give me flashes of why I came to the planet. I mean, who would, 
who would admit that one of the intentions I have is to pattern an empire after what Miss Winfrey did in the way that she changed the world in her time. In 2006, I set the intention to transform the way we do grief worldwide. I don't need to reinvent how we do that. Miss Winfrey laid it out for us, laid it out for me. I am very intentionally patterning what I'm doing after what she's already done. Where did I get that? My imagination, my imagination. So Shelly, what are your, what is your God given barometer? What is your heart saying about everything that Susan shared with us? Oh, I'm right in line with her. Um, in fact, we have a sign over our front door that says, imagination is evidence of the divine. Oh my. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah. I love so, that. Would you call that intuition? Imagination, would that, could that be another word for intuition? Sure. Um, I think you tap into the creative when yeah. you tap into your imagination. And, yeah. um, and when I work in, I, I make jewelry. Um, when I work in there, it's all channeling the divine. Um, it, it really, that's the creative force for me. And I don't think about it. Um, I just feel it. So, uh, yeah, imagination and intuition would go hand in hand as far as I'm concerned. So I love what you said, Susan. My, yeah. My, yeah. Open. yeah. my heart has settled down a little bit. What is the sign that you have about imagination? What does it say? Imagination is evidence of the divine. That. Wow. I've never heard that before. That, that's know. wonderful. <laughs> I Tom, saw that it, be I knew it was ours. And you're you're an animator. You're that that's well, how you started. Yes, I came from the Midwest to work at Disney. That was my intention <laughs> from the time I was a little girl. I was distraught when Walt died, and I was ten because I knew I'd never meet him, and I worried for what would happen to the studio. Those are my two thoughts as a ten-year-old. So mm -hmm. when I was twenty-five, I finally moved out to LA and got my job at the end of my rainbow and went into animation as an assistant director. Um, I never did animate, but my husband did. And um, we, I, I was with him through several projects and some of them he, he directed. And uh, so we raised the boys on the topics of the films like Tarzan, we studied Coco the gorilla, um, Pocahontas, he didn't direct, but we studied Native American tales. And I was raising boys during this time. So I was trying to bring the stories home. And then of course there was Frozen and Frozen 2. And those were, yeah. <laughs> the boys were grown, but um, they took over the house for 11 years. So forgive my ignorance, but who actually wrote the story that Frozen is based on? Well, that was a combination. Um, he had some input. His co-director is a writer. So she wrote the screenplay and they worked out the story together. Um, there's a team of story artists uh, that add to the story and add humor to the story. Um, it's a very collaborative effort. I'm, I'm always curious. I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but like when I watch something like Frozen, I'm like the multi-levels that this story is being told at. And I'm like, do the writers realize that there's this divine thread that's the spiritual lesson for the entire world? Or is that just me? No, they absolutely work it in. They know that they need to uh, appeal to a broad audience from the three-year-olds to the full-on adults um, and even older people. They, they really want to bring some poignancy to their stories. So I know you, I'm not sure what the word is. I'm gonna ask you this question. 
was your husband able to receive any type of recognition for directing Frozen? Oh, yeah, well, they got the Oscar for the first one, um, <laughs> which he dedicated to Ryder, of course, at the Oscars. Um, that little clip is on is on YouTube, I think, um, under Ryder Buck. But well, what, uh, was that like? what was that like for you guys to be there and you know you were nominated and everyone says that that's, you know, a thrill in itself, which I'm sure it is. And then his name is called. Oh, it was it was amazing and such a wonderful celebration of his work for six years. You know, these things take a long time to put together. So um, the recognition was really was really wonderful. And the, the film took off like no one expected. He thought he made a good film, but they had no idea the scope and the reach that it would have. So my 25 year old son and his friends, that is one of their top five favorite, favorite, favorite movies. Oh, that's great to hear. I love that. So did you feel Ryder's presence that evening? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, Ryder had said to a friend when she went to the theater to see the film alone, um, and she's quite intuitive too, she said she heard Ryder's voice say, I'm going to keep the box office up. So um, not to take anything away from the masterful job that everybody did making this film, but he was intentionally adding his energy to the success of the film. What I love about that, what I love about that is that I do believe that there's a role reversal that you and your husband parented, lovingly parented your son while he was physically here well, now he's in the presence of all that is divine. So the role reversal is he gets to parent you now. He's the guide. He's the more powerful. Can he keep the box office up? Apparently so, and he did. And I <laughs> yes. think that's true for you. That's true for Jessica. That's true for Susan. It's most definitely true for me. I mean, I would not be here speaking with the three of you without Trish, Aaron, Rory. I wouldn't. Yeah. And Shelly, I just have to just to add that, you know, in the no coincidences category. So we were living in Manhattan. Um, I am also in the Midwest. I'm in Table Grove, Illinois. But for Olivia's treatment, we went to Memorial Sloan Kettering. So we were living in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, just a few blocks away from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And while we were there in 2014, it was the height of Frozen. So my girls were just completely transfixed as was all of the world and you know still are today by that beautiful movie and that beautiful music and one of the many gifts of living at the Ronald McDonald house if you can find them as gifts which we absolutely did um the right the and I wasn't there because we were, we were actually inpatient. Olivia was, was really sick during that period. Um, but my Lillian and my mom were at the Ronald McDonald house. So the, the couple that wrote the music and their daughter that sings um, young Anna, is it Sanchez? Is that their last name? Am I right? Ali, Kristen Lopez. Lopez, Lopez. Yeah. So they were there during that time. But my Olivia, she just, she, so it was, the, the music was so healing and so transformative for her. The song, Let It Go. And then the words, that perfect girl is gone. She felt like she had to be so perfect. And she felt like she had to, you know, be such a trooper through all of her treatment. And when Elsa is, you know, slamming the door in her ice castle, all of, she would sing it with such, I know that she felt all the lyrics. So just healing on all ends. I had to share that with you that oh, we have such right. a even before we've met and before I met Tom, just all of these beautiful serendipitous seeds have been planted and with Susan. Right. So, yeah. I'll share that. I'll definitely share that story with my husband. It's so beautiful. Just, just so grateful. So Jessica, this is how I want to wrap this up. Although, as Shelly said, we could talk for five or six hours. Absolutely. So, so show the folks your t-shirt that yes. you designed. Them. And I want to ask Shelly and Susan if this resonates for them as well. 
I mean, one of the things I teach is a new way, a new way. And I know that it is a new way and it's, and it doesn't, it's not on everyone's radar screen yet. So. Yeah. It's, like we said at the beginning of, 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 of the show, this would not have been on my radar in 2014. So it's the words are, I signed up for this. And it's the infinity symbol, which is significant f for me for, for many reasons, but the infinity that love and life, it's eternal. There's no beginning. There's no end. Right. Um, so that's what it signifies for me. And then the heart, of course, love. And it's very significant for, for um, Olivia and I. And But I signed up for this, that we actually, we came here for a reason and for a really specific purpose. And, you know, that there's no coincidences that we're all being guided and lovingly guided, lovingly guided here together and held and embraced. And when I look at your beautiful. Does that yeah, right? absolutely. I, I love the t-shirt. I haven't ordered it yet, but I will. What about you, Susan? Yes, it definitely resonates with me. And I agree if someone had said this to me a couple years ago, I, I could not have heard it and I would have been really upset and angry. And, you know, I think about too, because I, I, I feel, um, you know, when I was a little girl, when I was seven and my grandmother died, my, my mother totally fell apart. And it's like, what drove, what, you know, what drew me to being a nurse that we have no nurses in our family? What drew me to hospice work? And I think, you know, at the time with my mother's example, it's like I, because she went into a deep depression for multiple, multiple years. I need to learn about death and how mm -hmm. to do this. And so I went into oncology nursing and then into hospice and then, you know, Ari situation, I'm still working with people at end of life. And, um, I, I, you know, I think, and because of Ari's dying, I see how I approach my work and I see what I bring to people is on such a different level than while he was still alive. And yeah, I guess this is, I guess this is what I, I guess this is my work. <laughs> what I was, yeah. I, <laughs> you signed up for this. I guess so, I signed up for this. Yes. So share with folks the name of Rachel's CD and how they can find it. So uh, Rachel's CD, Rachel Mazer is How Do We Get By? Mm -hmm. And it's on Spotify. It's on iTunes. It's on Apple Music. You can hear um, her music also on YouTube, Rachel Mazer, R-A-C-H-E-L-M-A-Z-E-R. And um, a number of her songs um, are about, you know, she wrote it very early after Ari died. So a lot of them are about her grief. And I just, I love the title, How Do We Get By? And, you know, the words too, and it's about it, the community, you know, how do we get by? So um, I'm very proud of her for, for it. Do you have a favorite song? You know, keeps on changing, but one of my, well, probably two of my favorite songs are, one's called Sleep, and it's about having a visit, a visitation when you're sleeping and, you know, wanting to go to sleep at night so that you can have this visitation. And my other, fav one of my other favorite songs is called Home, and that's about she and Ari, you know, wanting to go back, wanting to go back home, wanting to go back to how it was and um, you know th those those memories and those feelings. That's so interesting. Shelley mentioned the early sixes. The early sixes is a relatively new band. Two of my nephews are in it. Their CD actually debuts tomorrow. The, the whole CD drops tomorrow. And my favorite song on their CD is the song called Home, Home. Oh. My nephew, my oldest nephew, Danny, I'm his godfather. He wrote the song and they've agreed that we're going to use that song as the theme song for this broadcast, but we have to do the legal, you know, yeses, yeses, yeses. So YouTube will allow us to play it. No coincidences there. Yeah. I have to add, may I? Yeah. There is yeah. a song. There's a song by Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros called Home. And this was a song that popped on and reminded people of Ryder as he was so into this band. Um, and whenever I hear home, it's like Ryder's sending one of his own songs. 
So no coincidences. None whatsoever. So this is how we'll end. Remind us the name of the book that you and Ryder wrote and where folks can get it. It's called Leave Your Light On, The Musical Mantra Left Behind by an Illuminating Spirit. It's a little long. If you remember, Leave Your Light On, that's enough. Um, it is the name of the first song that Ryder ever wrote. So uh, it became his mantra. And, um, and they can find it on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can go to riderbuckmusic.com, which is his website and includes a lot of videos and you can kind of get to know him, but it also includes links to the book. So that's an easy way to find him. And it's so, R-Y-D-E-R. So Jessica and I will be back live next Thursday, 11 a.m. Central. What a delightful hour. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank, thank you. you so much, thank Susan. You. Thank you. Thank you to you all. Anytime, anytime. So let's all continue to leave our own lights on. <laughs>